everyone, welcome to the episode 10 of uh, Discovering the Architecture Middle Path podcast. So last episode, we discussed about platforms and we had two guests, uh, Gregor and Frank. So we are going to continue the uh, discussion uh, and uh, sticking to the topic platform. And as usual, Sanjay is with me and we have a guest as well. Hi, nice to be back. Uh, and it's great to have a, a fantastic new guest today. Christian Posta has been a long time specialist in integration and currently field C2 at solo.io, focusing on service mesh and APIs and all kinds of integration related technologies. I think the, I have known about Christian for a long time through online activity. And then uh, the last time we connected was pre COVID, which was at a KubeCon. Uh, but we've been in the same field for a long time. So welcome, Christian. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I look forward to this discussion. And it's good to see both of you again. Like I, like you said, we saw each other in uh, in KubeCon. Uh, big fans of uh, what you all are working on uh, and, and a lot of respect for what you've done in the industry. So, so thanks for having me. Great. Uh, thanks, Christian, for joining. So, uh, uh, so recently I noticed you wrote an uh, article and you had a bold statement by telling a full lifecycle API management is dead. Uh, so I would like to start from there. What's the thought process and why you came up with this idea? Because I think it got a lot of attraction from the industry. Sure. Um, so I, I, I think that these days there's so much content. There's so much stuff that people put out there. Everybody's trying to get clicks. You have to have a bold headline and so on. Uh, what I really meant was that the, the, the full life cycle API management vendors and the, the big suites of products that they sell, uh, that that approach is, um, you know, dying out. And, th and that there is a uh, an alternative approach that's uh, that's happening in the industry. Uh, a few people have called it different things, but uh, I I just wanted to point out that if you're thinking about full life cycle software related stuff, it should be thought of in terms of how you manage the life cycle of software in general, not just API systems that was the that was the point yeah I, I think in your article you had a very good point about apis are just software right and yes. so trying to say because we have a new kind of artifact we need to build we all agree apis are important and they need to be built just because you have a new kind of artifact to build doesn't mean you reinvent the flow and all the tooling around it on how you manage that right and this is a this is a pattern we see in the industry all the time. Whenever there's something new, you put everything around that and say, I got the magic new box that solves all problems. Exactly. And, and a lot of times, as you, as you probably know, in enterprise organizations, these magic new boxes create magic new silos. <laughs> yep. and, uh, and, and then from there, you know, that, that has a ripple effect. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because we have seen that uh, within enterprises that uh, these silos are building stuff and even they are not uh, sharing it across the organization as well. And then because of that, uh, there are some uh, lot of political dynamics coming as well. Exactly. Uh, so rather than they kind of keep on building applications, they are kind of uh, fighting with each other as well as duplicating <laughs> these stuff. Like uh, you can see multiple API initiatives and same API duplicate across the organization. So that is uh, something uh, uh, has been um, uh, created because of that approach uh, this organization has, uh, have taken. So uh, uh, I think for the uh, listeners uh, benefit, uh, there can be multiple definition for the uh, what is the full life cycle of an API, right? So a little bit explaining it might be useful as well because uh, people might have different uh, viewpoints of this. Sure, yeah. So I, I mean, the life cycle that we talk about is you, you, envision a new functionality for the business 
you try to define what an interface might look like for that. You then maybe put some mocking or testing behind it so that you can just kind of see the feel of the API and see whether your business partners might be interested in using an API that exposes the functionality or data that in a certain way. Um, and then you want to start building the functionality of it. You want to write tests around it. You want to deploy it. You want to actually have it usable. You have to expose it and allow people to, to uh, invoke it with the right credentials and security and quota management and availability, et cetera, some of these uh, runtime things. And then you'll need to make changes to it. Right? You'll need to version it. You'll need to um, add capabilities to it or around it or new APIs even then spring up around that. Uh, and then, you know, at some point you might need to think about uh, what, how does it, how does it get replaced or maybe it sunsets or, or maybe it doesn't, uh, how do you, how do you manage that from the beginning to the end? You know, and I just, I skipped over so many details in each of those, those phases, but that is sort of the, the life cycle that, that we look at. But I, I think I made the point in that article that this is true for APIs, but this is also true for other software artifacts, whether that's libraries or middleware or front end systems or whatever. They all follow a similar tra trajectory or, or, or life, uh, life cycle. And, and so that, and that's where, you know, th things like an API gateway, you see API gateway vendors, then they morph into API management systems. The, you know, I've talked with a number of uh, our customers or even just API, you know, just enterprises. And they say, you know, that we bought this big, you know, stack and the API gateway, we're using the API gateway heavily, but this other part, maybe the developer portal, for example, we're not Drupal developers. Um, we're, you know, we're, we're not using the developer portal. Uh, and then, you know, I ask them, well, why not? Because it doesn't fit. They wanted to customize it. They want to build their own thing. Uh, and then, and there are other pieces too. The, the, the client side tooling, they don't use that vendor's client. They use Postman or they use something else. Uh, and it became clear to me that just like in software, building any other software, um, you're, the, people are going to have, have opinions about what tools they use. They're going to want flexibility. Uh, and even though you buy this big stack that has all these checkboxes, yeah, 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 I want all this stuff, but then you don't end up using all of it. You use maybe some pieces of it. Uh, and so that, that, that again, like I, I wrote in the, in the article is, um, that, that also fits with what people do in, with, uh, with regular, you know, build, building any kind of software. Uh, so APIs shouldn't be, treated that much differently. I, I think on, on a, you know, on a bigger, if you scope out that con commentary a little bit, you know, we have this history in the industry of uh, aggregation and disaggregation of yeah. technology. When something new comes along, uh, there's a tendency to build an entire ecosystem around it. So you aggregate all the relevant pieces and and you try to capture more economic value from the buyer, basically. Even though in, in its right essence, there is a core beautiful technology that came out with API management, which was originally the API gateway and the OAuth protocol and all these technologies which were not there in, in the underlying technologies before that. And that was absolutely necessary. Nobody's debating, you don't need that stuff. Mm -hmm. But then to tie that with the entire ecosystem around it, was very much a vendor play and an analyst play mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. hey, you know, I got this, I'm better, and you don't got that, so you got to go build that now because otherwise you don't get the two stars, yeah. right? Yeah. And you, it's a food fight at some point, and you just playing catch up. And, and enterprises also fall into the trap then of saying, well, I'm doing an RFP, I have all these features that I might need, mm -hmm. so 
uh, in fact, many years ago, our, our founding CTO, Paul Fremantle, wrote a blog about why buying software with RFPs is a very bad idea. Because mm -hmm. you have to imagine all the features you are you will ever use and say, do you have this feature right now? Mm -hmm. Whereas you really should buy the product that you need now and, and have some comfort that it'll go in the direction that you will need as you need mm -hmm. it. Right. And and so same thing with this aggregated stuff. So it's what is exactly what you said about okay, they buy the API management product, they're not using the Drupal based portal because we're not Drupal hackers. You know, or we have our own proprietary architecture and we need to just take the data and render it the way we want. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet you kind of paid for it because that's how the pricing works. Um, and and uh, governance is another one, right? There's, you know, Uber governance that you can build around this stuff, but getting it in deployed and used in production in practice in, a, in an enterprise is a political and social political challenge, not a technical challenge. So I think there's a lot uh, there about... Or this question of this sort of, you know, abstractly what's happening is you are taking uh, the, the the kernel of a beautiful idea and you are aggregating supporting artifacts because, it you know, it's not done maliciously. It's done as yeah. a way of saying, well, it makes sense. But then what you get at the end is this big old thing that doesn't make sense. Exactly. It doesn't make sense in the context of everything else. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because nothing yeah. is lower. The, the bigger enterprise right. you go to, you know, if every single component decides <laughs> it's going to capture the whole playing field, it doesn't work. Right. Right. Exactly. And so that's why, like, <laughs> I specifically, because I worked at big enterprises, I worked at a big bank, I've worked at, you know, the Department of Energy here in the United States, and actually I actually started my career at Intel. And I've seen big enterprises and, and how they work, but I've also seen they... You know, they, they, they want to improve. They want to, <clears throat> I guess, not within the last 10, 15 years, we talk about modernize, but even before that, they, or, or cut costs or whatever, they want they want to improve in some way. And they will they will invest money in this new thing, hope, hoping that it will improve this old thing, but then they end up just doing the same thing and nothing gets improved, right? Uh, and... I feel, and I don't, I don't, I work for vendors now. I worked at Red Hat before this, but, uh, you know, at Solo now for almost six, I think six years, something like that. But I, I, I do want to help these organizations improve. And as you pointed out, Sanjeeva, this is not just a technology. You don't replace one technology for the other. It doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem alone. Um, you, you need to have the, the, the people part of the yeah. of the equation evaluated as well i think uh, that reminds me the um, uh, recently uh, our friend kin lane he tweeted uh, you are not governing the apis you are governing the enterprise uh, mm -hmm. so i think uh, that kind of uh, gives us like you had to look at that uh, have a holistic view uh, and i think that's where I still the enterprise architecture is playing a role. Even we move to this um, uh, decentralized uh, microservice-based architecture, but uh, you need to look at it from the enterprise view and then get all these uh, uh, connected uh, technologies as well as uh, uh, other systems uh, to kind of give that end-to-end -end experience for the developer. And I think that's leading us to uh, the next topic about the internal developer platform because uh, platform engineering is a really hot topic with that uh, uh, internal developer platform uh, concept um, came to the uh, market and most of the enterprises are trying to build an internal developer platform in some way. Uh, so I would like to uh, kind of move to that because even you are, uh, you have structured the article, uh, how API management uh, will not be a silo, it's part of the internal developer platform. And you can share a few uh, insight about uh, the internal developer platform and what's your view on that, uh, that would be great. Yeah, um, I think, even with my work here at, at Solo, we, we, we work very close because I think a, a, an overarching theme of the article also was, you know, organizations want this flexibility. They end up turning toward what looks like the best of breed selections for these particular areas. Um, 
but what we see, so that's that that's that's one part of the of the of, of what I was looking at here. But another part is the the organizations that we talk with today. They to to get API changes, even with their full stack systems, everything that they have, to get changes from their developer's laptop into production um, can take weeks. Uh, and like the reason why is because they don't own the API management systems. For them to make changes, they go and they open tickets and they, they wait, they sit and wait. Uh, and then they wait for management, API management team to make some changes for the networking, maybe load balancing team to make some changes and DNS and security and all, uh, whatever it takes. And uh, that slows them down. Uh, one of our, one of our, uh, our our customers talked that they did an internal case, uh, report and case study and try to figure out because they built this platform and they were like, well, why is it still taking so long? And they went and they found that 25% of the time that developers are spending on getting their services to production is around either hand coding some of the this API management stuff themselves because they don't want to deal with you know opening tickets, or they're opening the tickets and sitting and waiting, right? And so that slows them down. That creates all these inefficiencies. That's you know, that, that's part of the. So you have this. I want I want to choose the tools that I only forced into a particular stack, but how do I how do I get my end users? How do I get the developers to uh, uh, to consume that uh, and and make it self service, make it efficient for them to uh, to to do that, um, and and so that's where these things start to come into the picture. Because yeah, you got the tools, but then you also got you know, how is the organization organization going to change and do it in a way that allows people to work efficiently, and that involves people, right? Um, so yeah, those, those, those things come together and that's, that's where we start to see things in the, in the developer platform, internal developer platform space. Yeah, I think, I think the, the, uh, the that's a very good explanation of how that transforms, how, how the world transforms. Uh, if you really want to deliver value to enterprise, which is about productivity and, mm -hmm. uh, sort of, uh, making the, uh, capability available, uh, sort of democratizing IT, democratizing development not at the just not at this sort of low code way of saying everybody can write some code well writing code is only like in in a real enterprise the writing the code is an important and critical part but getting it to work in the context of everything else in the business is often a bigger task right yeah and and that process getting that simplified down to the point where that reduce that time is reduced is critically important right so and and you know, again, again, it's kind of like in the history of the software industry. So I, I've been, this is, I think this is my, now, uh, uh, I think I finished my bachelor's in 1988. So I'm 34 years since I, 34, 36, whatever, 36 years now since then, right? So uh, uh, what I've seen over the years is that we, uh, there are times in the, in the, e, in the development where we fight over this layer of the stack. You know, there was something called the Sun One uh, uh, web server. Nobody knows what it is now, right? Uh, and there were fights about, am I using Apache HTTPD? And then Nginx came along, kind of took over in some areas, especially in the Kubernetes world. Um, and, and all these kind of battles at that level, but today nobody cares. Something deals yeah. with HTTP perfectly correctly and delivers it, that's it. And we don't care. It's not a best of breed problem. So same thing really about the problem of managing access to network interfaces. When, mm -hmm. when you put up a network interface, you have to manage it. I mean, you know, it, it's like saying I'm going to uh, go out into a, a infected situation without wearing a mask. You don't do that. Mm -hmm. You have to have a mask that filters some stuff and controls it, right? If you're in an infected environment and the internet is a highly infected environment and so is the intranet in today's mm -hmm. environment. That's why this whole zero trust, all this stuff comes in. So that means you would never expose anything to anybody without some kind of a a security guard in front of you, which is my mental model for what an API gateway implements. And um, and does it really matter for any application developer, whether that is from vendor A, vendor B, vendor C? 
you know, this best of breed problem has gone away from that now to saying, how do I deliver an end-to-end experience? Uh, so API management is like, a, you know, if you go to a really high quality restaurant, uh, if you ever need anything, the service staff is right there. But if you don't need anything, you don't see them. They're kind of omnipresent and not present at the same time. Right? Yeah. That is what API management should be in a, in a in an internal developer platform. It is there because when you need it, it's always there. And you cannot make a mess and say, well, I forgot to put route this through the API gateway. It cannot be allowed because that's not okay. Right. So that kind of experience is really what brings the power of the development, power of the 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 abstraction of an API and make it accessible to everybody. Right? And internal developer platforms are a good way to package that together. They are, definitely. Uh, I'm 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 reminded because this this you know interaction between developers, what they need, and you know, ultimately getting things out to production. Because the, the developers are, are building the stuff to put in front of customers and put it in front of uh, uh, in, in production. I worked at, uh, at Zappos.com for a little bit. And when I was there, I saw the way that some of their internal mechanisms worked for uh, keeping up actually with their their inventory. I think at that time they sell everything now, but they were selling shoes and, and that kind of thing. One thing, and I think Tony Shea wrote about this in his book, but I, I didn't know about it. I didn't see it until I, I was actually working there at Zappos. What they did was the, the buying team, the team that would go out and buy, uh, you know, um, the, the, the shoes and the, and the stock and, 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 get, and get stock. What they did was, the, and they're, I guess, in the industry has always been this uh, hostile relationship between the, the vendors and the buyers because the buyers want to get the best price. And so they don't always give them all the information. They don't, so that you have this sort of at arm's length uh, relationship. But what Zappos did was they changed it. They inverted it completely. They said, hey, vendors, I'm going to show you all my stock. I'm going to show you what is being bought by our customer. I'm going to show you all this stuff because I want you to tell me when should I be buying all this? You know, when, when stock goes low, I want you to keep track of it. I want you to show me. Right? So I inverted that relationship. Uh, and that was extremely powerful because now when stock got low in a certain item, the, the vendor could say, hey, why don't you just buy this and you know, give you this price, blah, 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 blah. And worked out a lot better for Zappos. They were able to give a better uh, experience to their customers by, by doing that. In essence, what they did was they opened up an API into their platform into their systems and allow this partner to consume it and, and self-service basically themselves. Um, and that's what we see. What I, what I think we see is with the internal developer platforms, they don't like the, the, the developers, like you said, they don't care what the API management system is. They don't care what load balancers are in the way. What they want to do is they want to get their code to production. Just like the, the vendors, they want to sell their stuff. Uh, and if you make it easy for them to do that, hey, deploy application A. Okay, now all this other stuff happens the way that it's supposed to happen for compliance and for reliability and, uh, you know, HA and all this stuff. And that, and that just automatically happens. Uh, that's what the developers care about. Get my code out to production quickly. I don't want to open tickets and sit and wait um, and have this hostility between the, the silos. And, um, and that, that's the direction that people are, we, we see people starting to go. But then on the other side is, all right, uh, that's the experience we want to give. And on the other side, well, how do we make that happen? And that gets complex. Right? That, that, that building the platforms themselves gets, gets fairly complex. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, so. The while, while we kind of identifying these API management type of capabilities are key for the developers, the platform engineering teams are ignoring that part. So that's where, like we uh, when we were when we were defining the uh, 
capabilities of the internet developer platform we put them into two buckets uh, software engineering related practices and capabilities and then um, the delivery and operational related uh, capabilities so for some reason most of the platform engineering teams are focusing on the second part how we get these pipelines and then how we get some dashboards for the operational efficiency so that uh, first part of the uh, uh, software engineering stuff were ignored uh, so i think that's where like uh, we have seen even the platforms are building uh, the developers are not uh, getting the maximum out of it because they don't get what they want inside the platform and uh, that has become a issue as well as platform engineering has become another gatekeeper uh, because of that not somebody who is providing value to the developers mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think that's that's an important point because i mean the purpose of building a platform within a company is so the enterprise can engineer software and get it out right and and a typical enterprise today uh, has hundreds of pieces of software they need to engineer it's not just one website it's not just one mobile app it's hundreds of integrations hundreds of apis hundreds and thousands of you know various kinds of things that they do so that problem of enterprise software engineering is really the purpose of whatever this stuff is to enable that and one of the fundamental tenets of software engineering is about modularity and reuse and that's again where that api abstraction plays such a powerful role because apis and of course apis are not some modern web thing you know unix has had apis operating system has had system calls and all these different layers of apis the the modern web kind of thing is that it is network accessible over essentially an rpc like protocol of some kind not always rpc grpc is rpc some of graphql is rpc some of them are more one directional there are all kinds of protocols but finding the right balance to create that modular architecture which is what allows the business to become an api first enterprise which is another i think a tagline that a lot of people are talking about now that you know make the business work with apis uh, requires a, a little bit of an art form because finding the right modularity um, deciding the difference between because the modularity and reuse there are different ways of reusing software one is as software itself which is the way we used to reuse which is you write a piece of code and you put it out other people get to the code and reuse it as a library in some fashion once the network developed to the level it has now we can just reuse the capability instead of reusing the software i can call you over the network and you do what i need and then i don't need to deal with your software right that was the beauty of the web for information originally and then web 2 onwards was for computation basically um and and so i think getting that facilitated in the enterprise at scale so that any developer can just focus on their part go find everything else inside the enterprise through the discovery infrastructure which needs to be part of the internal developer platform and then all the the delivery operational support of getting the logs to you know security scans to all the things that Kristen mentioned earlier has to flow through underneath for that to actually work so I, I think I think if you get that right it gets the enterprise an incredible amount of um, sort of uh, operating power mm -hmm. it becomes a business differentiator it becomes a major business differentiator right yeah, that's when you really become a digital business when you got yeah. to yourself all the digital assets you can now you can operate as a digital business. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that was the uh, uh, foundation for us to come up with this uh, idea of a platform less experience. So uh, Sanjeev, myself and Paul, like we got together and then write this manifesto. So what we are trying to uh, uh, do there, like uh, defining how to do platform engineering, correct? Because platform engineers should treat developer as the end user of what they are delivering and then look at it from the uh, developer point of view and uh, provide it uh, as a uh, uh, complete platform that they can be uh, productive and in the uh, manifesto we uh, looked at platform engineer as the foundation and then api first is like uh, the f fundamental feature 
and then we added cloud native middleware because you need various other stuff right to build a modern application and then the uh, developer experience is the uh, other uh, capability that we highlighted uh, trying to define okay how that uh, platform engineering team should provide this uh, seamless experience for their developers is what we're trying to address in that paper yeah uh, it was uh it, it's, it's a good paper it's good like the outcomes in in the paper are what i think the platform teams should strive for i think that's uh, i think that aligns with what we've been talking about here yeah i, I think overall the the you know the goal the goal that we all have in uh, software engineering enabling uh, API management, you know, whether it's service mesh or all these different tools that have been built over the last many years, this sort of middleware infrastructure that we've been building over the last 20, 30 years since the term middleware was invent invented, is really all about how can you give developers more and more freedom to focus on the creative part of development and less and less on all the mundane stuff you got to do in order to deliver your beautiful creation to the fingertips or the hands or the eyes or whatever of the consumer that is consuming that. Right? And, and yeah, the, I mean, it's all that stuff's plumbing, right? It's all plumbing, that plumbing. It's yeah. electrical wire. It's yeah. all the, all the, you can't live in your house, at least here in Phoenix without AC, <laughs> you know, it's all of those things that I don't really want to think about. I want to enjoy, yeah. enjoy my life. I want to do, you know, hang out with my kids and my wife and all yeah. that. I, I, I want to get, I want to get stuff done. I don't yeah. want to have to worry about all of that other stuff. Exactly. And and I, I just want to comment on the developer experience angle. One of the things I, I, I my after I finished my PhD, I was faculty in a university at Purdue University. Then I joined IBM Research. At the time, IBM had just bought Lotus Notes. So before Lotus Notes, IBM had no way to communicate with all employees electronically. They bought Lotus Notes and Lou Gerstner was the CEO. Uh, the first thing they did was deploy Lotus Notes to all of IBM. And Lotus Notes crashed and burned big time at the time because it wasn't scaled to that level. I think I'd be, I'd be met about 150,000 to 200,000 employees. And then by the time I left, it was 400,000 employees. By then, it was working beautifully. Uh, so before that, there was a bunch of stuff on a mainframe. So if you wanted, if you needed to do certain things, you had to log into the mainframe. Uh, if you want to do some things, you had to come here. So if you were to build something in the enterprise, then the developer experience was fragmented beyond belief. And... A, the the power of being a digital business one of the competitive advantages is very much the quality of your developers so if you want the best developers to work in your company you need to give them an experience that frustrates them as little as possible you have to frustrate them a little bit there's no way around it but as little as possible so that they can focus on you know creating stuff and having time with the family and and being able to you know enjoy without being frustrated and have all this mental gymnastics you need to do in order to deliver the outcomes that you're trying to deliver. I think that's why I'm very interested and you all are probably very interested in, uh, I'm very interested in the plumbing. I'm very interested in how that stuff, uh, yeah. you know, how, how you architect to, to eventually end up at, at the experience that the end user gets. Uh, what are the pieces that go into that? Uh, how do they integrate and, and you know live in the ecosystem? Because plumbing doesn't live just by itself; it lives in the house, right? Uh, those are the parts that are interesting to me. And I think, especially with the cloud native Kubernetes ecosystem over the last ten years, uh, it, it continues to evolve. It continues to improve, uh, and we see you know these uh, these. Uh, users adopted at scale and become very successful with, uh, with with some of this plumbing. So it's, I'm very interested in it. Maybe I'm just a plumber, but it's very interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. I think that these, uh, in some of these uh, enterprises, there are part-time developers, right? Like, okay, I think three of us uh, can take as a good example. We love to code, but then again, with other stuff, uh, uh, it's hard to find time. So then again, for a part-time developer, how you set up the sandbox, how you get into the uh, pipeline, if that is blocking, then they will not contribute, right? So I think that's another beauty that I see with the developer experience as well as abstract the uh, complexity so people can come and contribute in different ways within the 
uh, governance created by the enterprise and then uh, more collaboration across the organization as well. Right. Absolutely. If I take your plumbing analogy a little bit. So in, in the previous episode, we talked about electricity as an analogy. Yeah. But to take plumbing, right? Now, the plumbing in your house is not a standalone system. It integrates to the city, right. the village. Plumbing system integrates to a bigger system. And, and in every village, you need a plumber. But the mm -hmm. plumber, uh, but uh, not everybody who lives in the village has to be a plumber. You need one mm -hmm. plumber to make that community work. So similarly, mm -hmm. you don't need in the tech ecosystem the people to facilitate that platform so the other people can create. But mm -hmm. every company, like every house doesn't have a plumber. Like that, every company shouldn't have a plumber. It should be something you just rent as you need and you just, you know, you do what you do, which is the cool part. And plumbing yeah, is for absolutely. some people, but, you know, you don't need too many plumbers. Yeah, yeah, we, we absolutely. Are kind of unusual people who love that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I would like to uh, discuss a little bit about the future. And uh, since you are here, if we don't talk about service mesh, uh, it's something missing. <laughs> and I think a lot of people still using your book as the foundation uh, when it comes to service mesh. And personally, I like the mesh architecture, service mesh, data mesh, identity mesh, these type of concepts. So uh, uh, can you tell a little bit about uh, where the space is moving and what are the new things uh, coming up? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. And eventually, hopefully, some of the stuff that I talk about makes it into the second edition of uh, the Istio in Action book. Um, but in the interim, Lynn, Sun, and I are writing an updated version of uh, of a small, you know, those little O'Reilly packet books that uh, we released one maybe a couple of years ago now in Istio Ambient mode, Istio Ambient, which is the sidecarless um, version of Istio. But I would say from a, I don't know, 10,000 foot view, uh, what is the, or what, where the service mesh is going is it's, I've always, we've always talked about this as API management and service mesh are kind of, there's, there's overlap. Uh, and in some ways there's, if you squint a certain way, they kind of look the same. Um, let me get, let me give you an example. So we have a customer in Australia, uh, Macquarie bank and Macquarie bank. So when, when we first started talking with them, they were, you know, big box vendor, API management shop. Uh, they were looking, oh, well, they were actually looking for these exact, you know, uh, scenarios that we were talking about. They wanted to give more self-service. They wanted more fine grain API management at, you know, closer to their applications. Uh, they wanted to um, allow newer security approaches, but they couldn't make changes to the backend uh, application. So they, they needed a lightweight API gateway. Uh, and so when, once we started looking at their use cases, it, we, we said, this kind of looks like service mesh. Uh, you know, how do you get, the proxies closer to the applications and offload some of this API uh, stuff to, to them. And they said, and this was, you know, fair enough at the time, it was maybe 20, uh, 2019 or so when service mesh was still very rocky. And it doesn't matter which, which implementation you looked at. Istio certainly in 2019 was very rocky. And they said, no, that's okay. What we're going to do is just this micro gateway pattern. They ended up using our gateway, but the, they ended up using basically a gateway in front of a collection of applications or even a single application to be able to implement this distributed API management type thing that, that they, they wanted. And then they built automation around it uh, by having the micro gateway pattern. They had a uh, tenancy uh, already built in, uh, federation and so on, they built on top. But... Fast forward now to, 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 you know, today when we announced Istio Ambient. With, with Istio Ambient mode, what we do is we remove the sidecar. You know, traditionally service mesh, if you want to get the service mesh capability, um, MTLS, uh, telemetry, collection of observability type stuff, routing control, canary releases, retries, timeouts, whatever, you injected a, a proxy into the application or with the application, right? and every application had a proxy. Uh, 
you know, sidecars are not, you know, there's some drawbacks to them. But but fast forward to Istio Ambient, what we said is we're going to give you the, the capabilities of the service mesh, but with no sidecars. And so what that what that ends up mean what what that means is what we did in Istio is we said for MTLS capabilities, we'll deploy that as a node agent. So a node agent, just like a just like in a in a CNI, gets deployed into each uh, each node, and that agent is responsible for uh, enabling MTLS for just the workloads on that on that node. Uh, now, if you want layer seven capabilities, so retries, layer seven telemetry, um, you know, rate limiting, jot validation, anything that happens in layer seven. That happens in a way, uh, a middle proxy or a waypoint proxy that it gets attached to the route automatically, All right? So from an application standpoint, I don't have any sidecars. I don't know anything about service mesh. I just make a call over the network. I'll automatically get MTLS because that little node agent running on the node will, will do it for me. And then if I want retries and jot validation, whatever, the little node agent will know to send the connection to a layer seven proxy, right? And then the layer seven proxy will eventually give it to the, the destination workload. So what you end up having, having in service mesh is exactly that micro gateway pattern that you know some of these other organizations went off and, and, and built themselves. But you get it uh, with much stronger guarantees around um, zero trust networking because you have the MTLS and the workload identity and all that stuff. Uh, and you know upgrades now become easier because you can swap out these pieces unrelated to the app etc so service mesh has sort of evolved into this world where people were already going with api management which is distributed multi-tenant self-service api management um, and so i think as you see the future of service mesh continue to evolve i mean i think it needs to it's it's a, it's a distributed API management. Yeah, I think I think that's a very good way of looking at it. I think we, so. We, we've we've also been working on that problem from a slightly different uh, approach, uh, basically using Cilium, which is also a, a eBPF based CNI that lets you do the similar kind of approach like uh, S2 Ambient does. And and I think what what it does is it just uh, offloads a lot of that work from the sidecar to the node agent, and makes it much easier to manage um, and uh, the overhead. That the sidecars had per per container has now gone down. Then, so it, it's a very good model. There's a but there's yeah. a big difference between what Cilium does and how they do it, <clears throat> and how Istio Ambient does it, right? Um, Cilium. So Cilium tries to share a single Envoy proxy per node. Uh, sharing layer seven on a on a on a node that can basically get scheduled any workload um, and having users configure it however they want, in my opinion, is a recipe for disaster. Uh, Linkerd started down that path back when they had their JVM based agent and they, they said, no, we can't, we can't do this. This is, it's too unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the points of failure and so on. Yeah, and then and then and then Cilium also doesn't do MTLS. Um, yeah, there is a Cilium way to do MTLS, but but so I, I think that I agree with your point. If you let users go and do all that by themselves, you you will get a mess. So that's where the you need a abstraction for how you develop in this kind of cloud native architecture. That's where we have this other approach. We I think Asanka and Paul published a paper a long time ago called cell based architecture which is quite popular now, which kind of defines mm -hmm. an abstraction that lets the user think in a concept of a network cell with isolation. And we implement those policies underneath using Cilium yeah. or GeoAmbient or whatever. The user doesn't get to mess with it. So we are completely right. controlling that, but you get a higher level abstraction saying, hey, I'm working on my project and my project is a tiny little island that nobody else can peek into except at the points where I have told them you can peek in here. That's right. So that, that's yeah, right. I, I think the 
the, the key thing again is to make a large scale enterprise architecture work. The, you need the right abstractions in order to facilitate scale and you need the, the engineering abstractions to facilitate reuse and, and uh, modularity, right? Modularity and, and reuse. And the last part I would say is um, you want the abstraction, you want modularity, which sort of um, implies that you have good interfaces, right? Yeah. But, but the last thing I, I, I think that, that we see in, in folks building this sort of tooling and automation is declarative configuration, right? Uh, declaring what the end state intention is so that it, you can reconcile it with what the real state is uh, and then driving that in your GitOps or yep. whatever, you know, however, however you do yep. your, your, yep. your automation. But uh, yep. I think those, those pieces are fairly fundamental to, uh, to building these Absolutely. types of platforms. Absolutely. I, I think, I think that's what we all learned from Kubernetes, right? That's the beauty of the Kubernetes architecture, yeah. that it's a yeah. declarative stateful engine that says, Hey, I need to get here. I don't care what I need to do to get here. I'll get there somehow. And yeah. it's always out of sync. It's just trying to get there all the time. And, yeah. but the developer says, this is the way I see the world, make it so. And so exactly. a, a, a internal developer platform takes to need, needs to take that architecture of Kubernetes and uplift it not to pods and containers, but to higher level abstractions that are necessary for software engineering. Yeah. And, and then then you have a system that works. Yep. I'll I'll point out one other thing that we've noticed, which is even if you get to declarative configuration, if if you if you can declare what that look what what you can what the API should look like and, and that's your 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 interface. And then the things that it takes to make the system so to make it you know the end state, the more complex the steps that it takes to get the system into that state, obviously the more complex your system is. Yeah. Right? And if you can reduce that complexity in the system, then you can reduce the steps that it takes for reconciliation yeah. and, and so on. Yeah. And the more complex you make it, the more brittle it becomes, the more points of failure exactly. and the more difficult exactly. it becomes to debug when something goes wrong. Exactly. And things always yeah. do go wrong. Just today there was a yeah. big Azure outage and, uh, yeah. you know, we, we run a bunch of stuff on Azure and we were all affected. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. Yeah. So I think that brings us uh, to the end of this conversation. And I think it's a great uh, uh, set of information. Uh, thanks, Christian, again uh, for joining. And uh, we'll uh, uh, call you again for another episode on a different topic. Uh, um, anything, uh, Sanjeeva, Christian, you have to add at the end? Yeah, I just want to thank Christian. It was a fantastic conversation. It's always fun to talk with you. And uh, lots of new stuff that we talked about. I think there's a lot more we can talk about about these things. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, you having me. I look forward to next time. I look, I look forward to seeing you in, uh, in, in person at some point too. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. And uh, uh, stay tuned for another episode uh, in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm.